So I have my uh, um, remarks organized into three parts here. First is just to start with a big picture overview of where the current uh, security landscape in Africa stands. Second, uh, I wanted to review some of the key trends and patterns we're seeing uh, on the security front on the continent. And then third, just to leave you with a, a few sort of summary takeaways of what I see as some of the essential points to, to keep in mind as we, as we look at confronting security challenges in Africa moving forward. So as many of you know, Africa has a reputation for being the most conflict-prone continent in the world. And indeed, most every news item we see coming out of Africa reflects some negative occurrence, some crisis, the migration, cri uh, the mi migration exodus into Europe, et cetera. Um, but this um, uh, obscures what is really a more complex set of phenomena that define the security landscape uh, on the continent. Indeed, Africa has uh, more conflicts uh, in, in, uh, happening right now than any other part of the world. There's 12 countries that are currently uh, in conflict. But this has to be put in perspective. You know, there are 54 African countries, which is more than any other part of the world as well. And it also um, needs to take into consideration that we've seen a, a relatively long period of decline in the numbers of conflict uh, on the continent. So from a high of uh, 26 uh, or, or just over 20 countries in conflict in the early 1990s at the end of the Cold War, we've seen a 40% decline in the numbers of conflicts on the continent. And if we consider this in terms of the magnitude, um, uh, the devastating effects of today's conflicts are much less than what we saw in Angola, Mozambique, Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo in the, in the 90s uh, uh, and, and 2000s. And so um, it's important to keep in mind that there's, there's been this decline uh, and we've seen a recent bump up in the last couple of years with uh, some new, new conflicts in, in Burundi and, and Mali and, and Libya. But by and large, it's much less than what it's been. And this mirrors what we've seen globally. So, you know, the period of the Cold War, while considered a stable period between the superpowers, was actually um, uh, quite a volatile time in many countries around the rest of the world, especially in Africa, where uh, we saw um, uh, the superpowers supporting different sides and, and playing into other grievances locally. Um, and so recognizing some of these regional dynamics is, I think, uh, particularly important. So when we um, <clears throat> look at the conflict map in Africa today, here are the 12 countries that are in uh, conflict. I think the first trend or pattern I would want to emphasize is the importance of governance. So here, starting at the regional level, we see that conflict in Africa is not uniform, right? There are clear patterns of where conflict is concentrated. And by and large, you know, the, the locus has been in the central and in the greater horn of Africa uh, in terms of where instability is greatest today. There are wide swaths of the rest of Africa, particularly in southern Africa, large parts of western Africa, that have been relatively free from conflict uh, in recent years. And so this tells us immediately something about the neighborhood matters. There are neighborhood effects that um, uh, contribute to uh, broader instability. This uh, holds true at the national level as well. Um, and this graphic uh, is comparing the conflict map we just saw with the governance map in Africa. So this is from Freedom House's Freedom of the World Index. The green are the democracies, the yellows are, are the 
democratizers or countries in the middle and the reds are the countries that are autocracies or are considered not free. And here you see there's a, a broad overlap between areas of greater instability and conflict and those of autocracy or those that are not free. And, and in fact, of the 12 countries that are currently in conflict, 10 of them are considered not free. So it's not an exact um, overlay, but it's, there's a very strong relationship there. And, you know, this is for a number of uh, related but straightforward reasons. Um, you know, countries that are more autocratic um, rule with repression. They often rule uh, with exclusivity. So they're, you know, appealing to a particular ethnic group or political party or region, um, which uh, fosters patronage, which fosters inequalities in the society, which creates uh, marginalizations and, and resentments. And that's a recipe for instability. And in fact, statistically, we see, you know, democracies and democratizers, so the green and yellow countries in Africa, have about uh, half uh, the rates of, of falling into conflict as we see with, with the red countries or the autocracies. And this holds, when we look forward, when they do predictive analysis, countries that are better governed um, have about 50% uh, 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 less likelihood of falling into conflict over the next five to, to ten years. Um, and um, we see, you know, relatedly that there's a direct relationship between corruption and instability. Again, not just in Africa, but around the world. Countries that are more corrupt tend to be uh, more likely to fall into conflict, and the inverse is true. Um, Countries that are more transparent, have greater mechanisms of accountability, tend to be more stable. So there's, there's, a, there's a governance relationship that's an important to keep in mind. There's something that um, scholars call the political economy of autocracy, which basically means that when you're an autocratic government, you're... Um, your, your incentives are not the same as what you would be if, if you were a democratic government. You know, your, your means to power aren't the same. And therefore, uh, when you have resources at your disposal, you're using them um, to do the things that you need to do to stay in power. And for autocracy, those are different. To stay in power, you need the support of different patronage networks. You need support of the military or your security forces. You need the support of your political party. You need the support of key patrons. Um, and so those are the way that autocrats are going to use their resources. They're going to try to support those core constituencies. They may need to, the support of their, their ethnic, their home ethnic region. So they're going to dole out resources into those regions. Um, a democracy um, has more incentives to try to be responsive to a broader collection of interest they're looking to get votes. They're looking to get support from a broader swath of population. And so the incentives are different. And that's important to keep in mind when we talk about the political con economy of interest uh, in Africa. Um, uh, and so again, this comes down to a whole host of governance issues, including corruption. Um, Transparency International did a uh, 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 you know, they do their annual index of, of transparency, and they found, in fact, that of the, uh, the, low, the lowest 15 countries in terms of their transparency ind index, 12 of them are facing uh, challenges from violent extremist organizations. Okay. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how governance also affects um, uh, other areas of instability, and, and this is an example of displacement. Um, we've all seen in the news the challenges of, of migration, displacement of people from Africa trying to cross the Mediterranean into Europe. In fact, there's 18 and a half million uh, displaced people in Africa today. 
Um, these are internally displaced as well as refugees. And interestingly, you know, 71% of that number comes from five countries, uh, which we can see here on the map. Uh, and um, these countries, uh, all of them are in conflict. And in fact, of the 10 countries with the uh, highest uh, numbers of of people fleeing from, from, from those countries, nine of them uh, are autocratic. So again, the relationship between governance and, and security, that's in, important to keep in mind. We see the same thing with development, that um, countries that are uh, less, less well governed um, have poor developmental performances. Of course, the countries in conflict also um, suffer from higher levels of poverty. Um, less likelihood that their kids are going to go to school, um, uh, you know, less access to health care, and, and as a result, it leads to a vicious circle of underdevelopment, uh, lack of economic opportunity, uh, fewer jobs, and, and uh, continued instability. Is this over what period of time uh, are these numbers coming from? Like, this, this particular map is uh, of this current year. This current year? Yeah. Okay. Other things, other maps I'll have will have sort of trend analysis, but this is sort of uh, a picture of where we're at today. Okay. Thank you. Um, last thing to throw in about the governance side is Africa also has a problem of leaders not wanting to leave office. So um, uh, of the 54 countries in Africa, we have 19 leaders who've been in power for more than a decade. Uh, eight of them have been in power for more than 20 years, and, and four of them have been in power for more than 30 years. And so getting uh, African leaders to recognize the norm of uh, leaving at the end of their term limits is, uh, is a key challenge we have today. And it's the source of some of the instability that we're seeing on, on the continent. Um, an example uh, is Burundi, where the leader last year uh, um, was set to depart after two, two terms. He uh, he refused to do so, engineered sort of a constitutional referendum to, uh, uh, or a constitutional um, review to, um, to legitimate his staying in power. This has been a source of protest for the opposition and large part of civil society, and so the country has, has been in crisis since. We may be seeing something similar starting next week with the Democratic Republic of Congo. So there, Joseph Kabila is at the end of his two terms. December 19th is the last day he's supposed to be in office. But he is trying to use a, um, a, uh, a nuanced interpretation of the Constitution, shall I say, where uh, officially uh, a, a president isn't supposed to leave until the new president is inaugurated. And so they've They've gone on to not hold elections so that there can't be a new president yet. And so he is going to stay in office until there's an, there's an election, which, which they've been delaying. So December 19th is the day that his term ends, and, and we'll see what happens in terms of how the opposition handles that. All right, so governance effects matter at the region, at the, at the national level, um, and uh, um, they also matter at the local level. I think this is important uh, to keep in mind. Um, let's go back to our um, uh, uh, conflict map. That while th th we have these countries shaded in whole, in fact, many of the conflicts in Africa today are really happening within particular districts or regions of the country. Um, uh, these are often the marginalized parts of these countries. Um, and, and, the, and they're not only marginalized politically and, and uh, economically, they're often marginalized in terms of geographically. They're at the outskirts of, uh, of these, these countries, uh, these uh, center of power. So they're often along the borders of, of um, their jurisdictions. And this matters because it shows that um, governance at the local level is also quite critical 
to how people perceive grievances and then how they react to those. Um, in a number of these places, let's use Nigeria as an example. In northern Nigeria, there's been this, uh, this, this crisis with Boko Haram in the northeast for the last number of years. And uh, if you look at the socioeconomic data, um, people in those states in the northeast have educational attainment levels that are about 40% of what you see down uh, in, in the south of the country. They have lower access to health care, higher poverty levels, uh, and, and lower um, incomes in general. Um, there's also a perception um, that the government is, is corrupt and that it uh, is trying to exploit its populations. Um, so this is fodder for what we call spoilers, groups that are trying to sow instability for their own uh, political or economic <coughs> interest. And this is exactly the space into which Boko Haram has stepped by playing up these grievances, trying to mobilize support for their cause and the suggestion that they have a better way that um, in their case, uh, Islamic Caliphate will uh, provide stability and opportunity and finally release these individuals from the yoke of, of their repressive government. So the point is, uh, yes, local governance matters. It, it creates openings. But two, in today's Africa, um, you have uh, individuals, political entrepreneurs who are going to exploit that weakness. And they're going to put forth a narrative that's very negative towards the government. It may be based in some truth, but they're going to exploit, exploit that and try to rally support and, and make for a very poisonous atmosphere for the government that makes it very difficult to uh, regain that trust and support and cooperation that's so important when, um, when facing an insurgency. So it's important as we think about conflict in Africa today that we think about it at, at all these levels, at the regional level, at the national level, and at the local level where um, this nexus uh, often comes together. Um, um, and I guess the last point on that is that when we think about these security challenges, we need to recognize that these aren't traditional security challenges. These are societally based challenges. So it's this combination of political, socioeconomic, and security that then plays into instability. Uh, and it's often, uh, it's often uh, represented through um, non-state actors. Okay, so in none of these conflicts we're seeing in Africa today do you have a, a uniformed opposition rebel force. You know, they're all non-state groups or violent extremist organizations that um, are trying to destabilize, usually a part of a country, um, for political economic interest. And so the way that you defeat these organizations is going to be much different than you would with a conventional force. OK. Um, another factor that, um, before we move on to our, some of the transnational factors, another, another issue I just wanted to bring up quickly uh, with regards to um, African states is we shouldn't assume that African states are the same as states that we're dealing with uh, in other parts of the world. Africa is challenged by um, the problem of consolidation of its states. And so by that I mean, number one, um, there's often a weak sense of national identity within African states. Uh, people are more likely to align with their region, ethnic group, than with a national entity or, or, or vision of who they are as a people. Um, uh, by lack of consolidation, we mean that uh, there isn't a monopoly of legitimate force and that um, 
the state isn't present necessarily in all parts of the country. They're not present from a security standpoint. There's, they aren't present from um, a, a governance standpoint in terms of providing services. And so people are used to getting their needs met through other means. Um, and so it's important to keep in mind as we think about uh, how you respond to security challenges in Africa that um, we can't just assume the state is able to provide these services um, and is in a position to do so. There's often a capacity issue there and it's you know, led to different terms like fragile states or limited states or mediated states. The point is the government in many African countries uh, is often required to engage in some sort of alliance building with tribal leaders or civil society organizations in order to try to attain the coverage that it needs to provide uh, the services that people are looking for. All right, let's talk a little bit <clears throat> about um, another trend uh, that we see in Africa, um, and that's the transnational. So I've talked about the regional, the national, the local, and I've just said that the local is at the, is at the, at the focus of a lot of conflict. But now there's a, a, a sort of a curveball into the mix, and that even though the conflicts are often local, they're being uh, inter intersected with some of the global phenomena that are happening. Uh, and a uh, prime one here is the um, virulence of um, Islamist militant ideology. So this is a global phenomena. Um, and we have seen it gaining some traction in different parts of Africa. So this map is a um, representation of where we've seen attacks by um, militant Islamist groups in Africa over the last 12 months. And what you can see here is a couple of things that I would highlight. One, that these groups tend to be geographically concentrated in different places. Uh, you've got uh, Al-Shabaab there uh, off the coast of Somalia. You've got in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the beige, you've got Boko Haram there in northeastern Nigeria, in Lake Chad Basin in green. You have AQIM uh, scattered across the Sahel in red. In the north uh, is uh, the blue with ISIS. Um, and uh, there's a few purple dots uh, in the Sinai area uh, with groups trying to um, uh, assert influence there in the Sinai, Sinai Peninsula. So they're geographically concentrated. Um, yeah, they tend to be locally rooted. All of those groups are trying to gain territorial control uh, of the areas that they're working in, with the exception of AQIM. AQIM is sort of more of a regional focus. Their, their tactics are more to create uh, instability, hit and run uh, tactics to sow fear, um, to, to gather ransoms, um, and to, in general, uh, try to cast influence over, over the broader Sahelian region. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, um, you know, these groups uh, show that there's a diversity of actors on the ground. So we should be cautious about talking about a single monolithic uh, Islamist threat in Africa. These groups are all organ organized autonomously. Some of them have declared allegiances to the global uh, networks, ISIS or um, Al-Qaeda. Al For example, Boko Haram has declared allegiance to ISIS, but in fact it operates largely autonomously. So we've, we've got it colored uh, green, whereas there are some uh, ISIS groups that are operating in, in the north. I think the key point here is um, the Islamist threat um, globally has been intersecting with these local um, uh, conflicts that 
have been emerging. And it, it, I think it's useful from a trend standpoint to look at this and see how it's evolved over the last few years. So we have here's a time series analysis. So here's what the situation was like in 2010. You know, relatively quieter. You had AQIM in the north, largely in Algeria. Uh, there was some Al-Shabaab activity uh, in the Horn. Boko Haram was hardly, um, it was just getting uh, geared up. They had been in place since the early 2000s, but they hadn't been so violent until 2009. 2011, you could see a, a, a broadening in uh, influences of AQIM, growing of uh, Boko Haram. 2012, further consolidation of these groups. Um, in uh, 2014, you start to see the uh, influence of ISIS there in the north. Uh, you see Boko Haram uh, regional coverage having expanded. This continues in 2015, and this is where we're at today. Um, now, interestingly, um, we've actually seen some uh, progress on the ground in combating most of these groups this past year to 18 months. Uh, most of them are retracting I think the next map we do will capture that um, to some extent. The exception is Al-Shabaab, which um, has been on the ascendant uh, this past year. Um, but um, it's important, and it's again why I'm talking about this as part of broader patterns, that when we talk, about, we think about this, it isn't just a military um, challenge but it's an ideological one. And the fact that these groups have formed and have been able to get some traction on the ground uh, reflects uh, that there's some resonance with the message that they're putting out. And this message isn't just coming from within these countries themselves. It's a message that they're um, siphoning off from what we've seen in the Middle East. And so, so the, the Arab Wahhabi uh, notion of Islam um, has been projected into Africa. And this isn't something that just happened in the last few years. It's been going on for the last two decades. And in fact, we published a, a, a brief earlier this year on Islamic extremism in East Africa, which I recommend for anybody who's interested in this, but what we're seeing is a very strategic effort on part of some of the conservative religious authorities in Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states to project that ideology around the world, and including in Africa. And they're using a host of communication channels and networks to get that message out. They're targeting youth through schools and mosques, and it's having some effect. And so you're seeing intergenerational differences in the interpretation of Islam between uh, uh, younger generations and, and older generations. And the younger generation is much more militant and much more exclusive and feels much more aggrieved than older generations. Yes? Dr. Siegel, I've got a question for you. Based on this parole, would, um Advancements in technology within those countries, does that play a role as well? Being it that the social media aspect is the recruiting. So have you seen any connection with that? Absolutely. So um, the question is, you know, has social media and uh, the advanced uh, communication technologies made a difference? And it certainly has helped these groups to um, have uh, a farther reach than they would have otherwise. So they're able to get their message out. And again, I talked about the, the, the negative messages, messaging that these groups will do to uh, reduce support for government, but then the, the recruiting messaging that they're putting out on how they are the answer, how they can be a solution, how they can provide purpose 
for many youth in these societies. So it, it, it is empowering these non-state actors. And so um, I think it's important to keep in mind, again, in reference to my point about these are not conventional conflicts. A lot of these non-state groups, they're not powerful from a military standpoint. Anytime these groups are confronted with a military force, for example, al-Shabaab with, Ethiop with the Ethiopian army, when the Ethiopian army went into, into Somalia, they were defeated handily. So they're not powerful. African militaries could defeat these groups. The problem is they aren't usually standing around and fighting in a conventional way. You know, they are very much an asymmetric force trying to create stability, trying to use communication tools to um, shape the uh, ideologies and understandings of population in these marginalized areas, often, often Muslim major majority areas. And so that's where the locus of that battle is happening. Yes? And the example you gave about Ethiopia and, and Somalia, so when Ethiopia went in and, like you said, handled al-Shabaab, so did, how did that impact provision of services? Like, did that improve? Or was there a vacuum? Because now the use that depended on al-Shabaab for security and for means of, you know, making money, now they're gone. So, so if that vacuum isn't filled, then how does how does that impact stability in that region? Does it just create a vacuum and then they just come on back and say, see, we were the ones that gave you security and provided you with the means to take care of your family? Yeah, it's a great point and something I hope we're going to come back to. Um, it's the government, filling in the governance part that is often lacking, and that's the weakness. So the, the military part can be, it's, it's easier to, to address. It's what do you do afterward? Um, but just to clarify a bit of what you said, it wasn't that Al-Shabaab was doing a great job providing services themselves. Uh, right. and, uh, and indeed. They didn't provide services, but security. <clears throat> so if you aligned yourself with this, this group, then at least you know, you, That's right. you'd have um, an end to That's right. making some money, albeit illegally, but... Yeah, so uh, you're right. So people are put in a position, who do they make a deal with? Right. And they're going to make that calculation based on where they feel they're going to be safest. And so that's uh, where we're getting at. Yes? Um, I want to ask you about other, um, other motivating factors other than ideology. Because by the map, it's as if the message is actually resonating and they're becoming sort of more popular. And um, I'm, I'm wondering about sort of other motivations like necessity or clan affiliations, or particularly in Mali, um, the lack of the UN's capacity to really address counter the counterinsurgency about what's going on, as well as the political instability there, right? So I'd argue that it's less of, of, of an ideology affiliation or affinity, vice necessity or economic opportunity, or it's lack of governance in the area, or it's the UN isn't, and the United States is not capable to actually address the, the, the real challenges in Mali. So, because it's also in, um, in Kenya and particularly Somalia, like we know a lot of people who are joining Al-Shabaab are doing it, not, s some of them are, but some of them are not doing it because they necessarily agree with Al-Shabaab. Um, and, and the sort of large numbers of foreign fighters aren't going from such a in Africa. And I'd make the same argument in, uh, in, in uh, northern Nigeria. Like, you could argue there's a certain forcible recruitment of not necessarily a um, wanting to uh, an ideological affiliation with. Yeah. Okay. So the question, the point is that uh, reasons for people joining these groups isn't just ideological, and that's absolutely true. Um, and uh, what I am trying to convey is that there's a combination of factors. So yes, you have poor governance, you have uh, marginalization, this leads to receptivity. But there's an ideological element, which I think is important to keep in mind. And it isn't sort of uniquely emerging from each context. And that ideological element is, is global. And it's resonating in these different places. And so it's feeding into these other factors that um, have allowed these groups to uh, get established. And 
Um, I'm going to hold off on questions for now so that we can go through some of the other uh, trends that I'd, I wanted to highlight and then we'll come back. Um, I would just note that um, I, I referenced the dynamics in East Africa we, we captured in this recent paper. When we published that paper, we heard from a number of, of security sector professionals in West Africa who said, you know, we're seeing the very same thing here. And so that, I think, is my key point, that there is an ideological dynamic that's global that we need to pay attention to. And indeed, there's another dozen countries in Africa we're monitoring currently because of growing sense of uh, militant Islamist um, uh, ideology. And, and we'll have to see where that goes. All right, let me move on, and then uh, we'll have time. Hopefully, at the end, we'll, we can come back to some of the other questions. Um, so another uh, transnational dynamic I wanted to emphasize is um, piracy. Um, and here, this, this uh, graphic is um, from 2014, but it captures the general trend we've seen of a dramatic um, Downsizing in the threat uh, off the coast of Somalia, Gulf of Aden, um, but an upsurge in the challenges we're seeing in the Gulf of Guinea. And, uh, and indeed, this year, I think we're on track to see some 60 different um, attacks um, uh, of piracy or armed robbery on the sea uh, in the Gulf of Guinea. It's not at the same scale that we saw earlier in in, in the East Coast, but it's, it's still a problem that's out there. <clears throat> um, another transnational issue that we're confronting is the problem of uh, uh, narcotics trafficking and uh, transnational organized crime. These are the uh, trafficking routes of cocaine, which uh, you see transverse Africa at various places, mostly West Africa is the main transit um, area. And uh, while many people think that since Africa is largely, largely a transit area, it, it doesn't affect their security, indeed that isn't the case. Um, places that are transit stops end up um, becoming more violent, they provide inroads for these transnational uh, criminal syndicates to become established um, and then to expand uh, into other parts of the economy in these countries. Um, you know, the, the drug trafficking market in Africa is considered to be about $4 billion right now. It's probably an underestimate. But again, given Africa's level of economic um, development right now, uh, that's a lot of money. And again, thinking about this from a societal conflict perspective, that money is being used to co-op political leaders, co-op military leaders. And so it's playing on the corruption that may exist already to further weaken these countries and to uh, prevent their consolidation as a state. So it's a big, it's a big problem um, that I think doesn't get the attention it deserves. This is another map of how the heroin trafficking uh, uh, channels move, and this is it's mostly an East Africa um, phenomena. Notably, uh, we're seeing increases in drug use within Africa, both heroin and uh, methamphetamines, and so this is going to pose um, a health problem and it's going to feed the criminal uh, dynamics that uh, are taking hold in these countries. We published a, um, a paper a couple years ago on um, the dynamics of how this works in, in, in Africa with a focus on Guinea-Bissau, for anybody who's interested. Um, and uh, it sort of unpacks the, the way that the, the, the narcotics trafficking is intermixed with the political and economic dynamics in these countries. I would also just add that we're seeing a blurring of the line between these transnational 
these illicit transnational criminal networks and the violent extremist organizations. So as these extremist organizations uh, try to sustain themselves over time, just like other insurgencies we've seen, they need revenues. And what they are finding is one of the easiest ways to get revenues is through these illicit trafficking networks. And so, uh, for example, ISIS has been uh, uh, engaged in channeling some of the migrants the, the migrants who are trying to uh, um, uh, leave for uh, you know, cross Mediterranean and get into Europe, ISIS is controlling some of those trafficking routes, and estimates are they're they're reaping some 250 to 300 million dollars a year from um, from the bribes that they extort from those migrants. Um, AQIM has uh, estimated is estimated to have earned about 100 million dollars from kidnapping uh, in the Sahel over the last six-year period. Al Shabaab uh, is estimated to earn about 25 million a year from controlling the charcoal market in uh, out of Somalia, um, and uh, Boko Haram has uh, generated revenues by uh, controlling some of the dried fish and other uh, trading routes out of northern Nigeria. So the, the distinction between transnational organized, organized crime and, and violent extremist organizations is becoming increasingly over, overlap, and it's something that we will need to pay attention to. All right, another trend that um, we should have on our radars is uh, climate change. And Africa is the continent of the world that is expected to suffer the, uh, the most serious effects from climate change and, 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 and earliest effects. Indeed, we're starting to see that in different ways um, uh, with fruit floods and droughts in different places. But the expectation is that um, growing um, aridity is going to contribute to farmers losing up to potentially 40 to 80 percent of farmland for key crops, such as maize, millet, and sorghum, by 20 between 2030 and 2050. Um, about a third of Africa's population already live in drought-prone areas, and so if that trend continues, we could see um, another 75 to 250 million people at risk. Um, and the UN estimates that, you know, we may see 50 million climate-induced migrants uh, uh, on the move uh, in the coming years uh, if, the, if these uh, environmental challenges um, continue. Um, <clears throat> this is related to another phenomena, another trend of growing urbanization. So it's actually a dual process. First, there's population growth. Africa is um, the youngest continent in the world. There are 70% of the population is under the age of 30. So you have a very um, uh, broad population pyramid. And so we're going to see rapid population growth over the next 30 to 50 years. Um, there's an expectation of uh, a doubling of the urban population by 2030. So we could see, uh, I think there's 1.1 million people in Africa today. The expectations would be 1.6 billion people um, by 2030 and close to 2 billion by, um, by the end of the, the century. Uh, so Nigeria, currently 163 million, it's expected to go up to 273 million people. Ethiopia is expected to go up to 138 million. Um, uh, Tanzania is supposed to more than double to close to 80 million people. And, and we can go on uh, on that. Many of these people are moving to cities. Um, and so Africa is rapidly becoming urbanized. For a long time, Africa has been a rural 
uh, has, has had mostly rural populations. And so this is a major shift demographically. And um, the estimates are that African cities are adding between 15 and 18 million people a year currently. And more than half of the people living in African cities now, nowadays are in unplanned settlements or slums. And so uh, this is creating a new set of security challenges. And indeed, we're expecting that the locus of insecurity in Africa is going to shift from the rural, you know, from rural insurgencies to urban-based um, security threats. Uh, probably some form of criminal syndicates. Indeed, we talked about ungoverned spaces at the rural area, but we're seeing ungoverned spaces in the urban areas, in these slums. And so it's creating a vacuum for uh, these uh, illicit groups to come in and provide so-called services, but basically you know, extorting local populations to um, further their economic interest. And people are put in an awkward place of you know, how do you navigate um, uh, that, that dilemma. Um, and so with more people in urban settings, more people relying on cash for the, their basic needs, if there's any price fluctuations in food or fuel, it's, it's quickly going to lead to survival challenges for many millions of people. And so the recipe for riots and instability um, will be greater. All right. Um, one last trend I wanted to throw in, and this is not a threat trend, but it's a sort of institutional trend, is that um, over the last 10 years, we've seen a significant increase in African countries uh, contributing forces to peacekeeping forces around the continent. So today, there are some 65,000 African peacekeepers serving in uh, 10 peacekeeping missions around the continent. And uh, one of the factors scholars point to as, as contributing to the decline in conflicts and the magnitude of conflicts we've seen in Africa over the last 20 years is the um, commitment of peacekeeping forces on the continent. And so African countries have taken that seriously. They've been contributing more forces. In fact, of the 18 top uh, troop contributing countries, 14 have increased their commitments since 2010. It's about a 46% increase uh, over that time period. And so we have more countries contributing more troops, which has provided uh, uh, more of a resource for um, uh, these, these units. Um, and it's consistent with a framework called the African Peace and Security Architecture that's come out of the, the African Union where there's a commitment to collective security, recognizing that a lot of these security challenges have neighborhood dimensions to them. And so there's interest in, in all countries on, on the continent as contributing proactively to trying to mitigate them before they spread. Um, and, and recognizing the capacity limitations of individual countries. And so this Africa peace and security architecture, it's still, um, coming together, but it's being, uh, it's being played out in these troop commitments that we are, are seeing by various Af African forces. All right, let me move on now to um, the final uh, part of my talk on, on takeaways that um, um, I think are important. So we reviewed here the importance of governance, capacity, some of the structural issues with demography and environment, and the institutional changes and trends that are happening on the continent. All of these are combining into the complex mix of factors that are shaping the security environment. And I find an apt metaphor for thinking about the security threat in Africa is to think about a virus, a cold virus or any virus, and you know, viruses are always around, but they tend only to, to um, 
uh, succeed or uh, become embedded and, and make somebody sick when that person's immunity system is down. And so I think it's very similar to what we see in Africa that every country faces challenges, there are grievances, uh, there's poverty, there's, there's um, other shortcomings. But the countries where we're seeing the insecurity emerge, it's in where their immunity is down, where their governance structures are weakest, where their capacity is lowest. And that is allowing these non-state actors whether the violent extremist organizations or, or the transnational groups to seep in, exploit those fissures and gain traction and, and wreak more havoc in those countries. And so for every security threat we're talking about, I think we can drill it back down to some of these um, immunity challenges or these governance weaknesses that are making them vulnerable to the, the security challenges that the continent is facing. And so my first takeaway is that the societal, the, 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 the key co conflicts we're seeing in Africa aren't your, your father's conflicts or your grandfather's conflicts. You know, it's a new set of conflicts. These are societal conflicts. And so we have to think about them differently um, than we have in the past. And again, these groups are not necessarily militarily strong but they're rooted in different socioeconomic and political dynamics in these societies that are giving them more traction and resilience. Second is uh, um, that legitimacy matters. So as I said, democratic countries are less likely to fall into conflict. Um, and this is especially true given these societal dimensions of what I was just talking about, even at the local level. Trust matters. That's how you're gonna get more support from local population with government. Um, and responsiveness matters. So if governments have more of an incentive to be responsive to schools and health clinics, uh, creating jobs, that is going to have a positive response and elicit more um, partnership with these local communities. This applies not just to the political governance, but it also applies to security governance. And uh, you know, many <clears throat> African uh, security sectors, especially the police, have a, have a trust deficit with their local populations. Surveys show police are among the least trusted institution of many African um, governments. Um, and so at this point in time where these societal conflicts are so um, important, that trust is going to be even uh, more critical moving forward. Keep in mind that you know, these governments aren't operating on a neutral playing field. They're operating with these spoilers, or these uh, uh, insurgent groups that are actively trying to um, sow more distrust and so, so less cooperation with government. And so they need to think about how they engage, not just on the ground, but how they deal with the ideological and communications battle. Third point I would uh, leave you with is, um, if government is the problem, is part of the problem, then we can't assume this to be part of the solution. So by this, I mean, you know, in, in many cases that we're looking at, we have autocratic governments that are predatory um, and corrupt, and they are active parts of the conflict. And um, they are often uh, trying to um, quell whatever unrest is there through heavy-handed tactics that is actually fueling greater alienation among some of these marginalized communities. Um, but if the government is operating under this um, notion of the, of the political economy of autocracy, you know, if, if their goal is to stay in power, not necessarily to provide services, then <coughs> external support to those governments isn't necessarily going to lead to more stability or better conditions. What that's going to do is further their ability to control um, you know, their constituencies. It's gonna further their hold on power. So I, th I think we have to think that, think about that in every 
context we engage in Africa? What is the political economy dynamics? What are the incentives for our potential partners? Um, as a Western country, we have a tendency to assume government is trying to do the right thing. They're operating in, in, in the interest of the people. You can't make that assumption in, in, in a number of African countries. It varies. And that's what we saw in, that, in those early maps. Um, so we need to recognize the variance and engage appropriately. Fourth point, is we have to think about security in Africa as a game of four-layered chess. So there are these different um, spatial layers. There's the local area where most of the interactions uh, between government and, and citizens are happening and is often neglected. There's the national level and, and what political incentives are there to try to provide services. There's the regional or neighborhood effect that we talked about and to what extent are neighbors um, contributing to, to stability or instability. And then there's this global layer where there's the ideological influence, communication influences, sometimes financing and, and trafficking influences. We need to have all four of those layers in our view as we think about solutions. And the tendency is to focus on one of them and say that's the problem, when we really need to have the vision for, for all four. And last um, is the point that stability in Africa today is a, is a battle for trust. It's a battle for trust with local populations. Um, and governments are often starting from a deficit because of you know, perceptions of past corruption and uh, unresponsiveness. And, and they're dealing with an active and effective opponent who is able to use communication tools to um, deepen that sense of grievance and distance from governments. And so to regain stability in Africa, yes, there's going to need to be some of the formal security um, uh, methods, approaches, but there's also going to have to be this governance and communications effort to uh, regain trust and, and support and cooperation with local populations. So with that, I will, um, I will sit down and uh, look forward to carrying on the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much.